sure people can see the slides. I'm a field biologist, I conducted my, most of my research in the outdoors in savanna ecosystems. My limited experience in this part of the world comes mostly from a sabbatical leave I took early in my days at the University of Arizona, and that was at Berkeley. And so I've been studying field biology, field ecology, and seeing what patterns can be explained by various phenomena. So beginning in the early 1980s, when I was a graduate student, I started looking to paleoclimatological data to try to explain what was happening with plant populations. And I maintained that kind of study, that interest in climate change over the last, however long that is, 40 or 45 years, and more recently have become interested in studying abrupt climate change and the impact of abrupt climate change on plant systems, mostly plant systems. Although, more recently, I've begun to branch out a little bit and look at work like Dr. Berry's, and all of it indicates to me that we're headed for a very terrifying time. So, it's hard for me to disagree with anything you say, because that's not the research I do. I think that we are probably headed for more rapid climate change than the IPCC indicates with their assessments, which have been demonstrated even in the peer-reviewed literature within the last two months. The IPCC assessments have, have been proven very conservative. So relying upon them is throwing the percussionary principle to the wind, something we do particularly well as humans in society. What was that new report they just did? About the so the latest IPCC report came out in October of 2018, and that was an assessment they came up with off schedule, a few years ahead of schedule, and they no longer are adhering to the 2100 timeline as they did during the first five assessments. Instead, they say if we don't make real changes by 2030, we're in trouble. A month, approximately a month before that came out, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, indicated we have until 2020 to turn this ship around. So both the IPCC with their latest report and the Secretary General of the United Nations indicate that we need to do something very dramatic in the very near future given the number of warnings we've received so far and our collective lack of response, I don't see us taking the kinds of changes. In fact, I don't even know what those changes would be that might prevent us from entering a Pliocene climate, for example. That's a big word, what does that mean? It's only three syllables. <laughs> Pliocene is the climate we had roughly two and a half million years ago to approximately five million, maybe 5.3 million years ago. And it's a much warmer climate than we are experiencing now. A paper from the December, maybe 18th issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences indicates we're headed for that Pliocene climate in the near future. As early as 2030, in fact, which suggests to me that 2030 is a tad too late to try to turn anything around. If we're in a Pliocene type climate, I can pretty much assure you that none of us will be involved in that sort of climate. It's just too rapid a change for human animals to keep up with. It's too rapid a change for almost any organisms to keep up with. It's, there's, there's little question that we, in this, the sixth mass extinction, we are proceeding about an order of magnitude faster than during the great dying of 252 million years ago that Dr. Mary Berry mentioned as one of the key points in the mass extinction events from the past. All right, looks like you want to talk about mass extinction. Let's, let me do that for a little bit. And I guess Dr. Berry, you may have your, so you can sit there. Or... That's all I get. I'm not going to go through very many of these slides, but that one's been up there long enough that I'm bored with it. Can you just hit the button, please? <laughs> yeah, hit the button again. I'm familiar with most of this stuff, so I don't find it very interesting, so I'm just going to go through it real fast. <laughs> oh, wait, that doesn't make any sense. We are in the midst. Can you back up one? <laughs> 
we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction uh, about a decade and a half after scientists were writing books indicating we're in the sixth mass extinction. At least a decade after those kinds of books were coming out intended for the lay public, the scientific referee journal literature finally caught up in 2015 with a paper by Serardo, Gerardo Sabayas and colleagues uh, with a completely unrecognizable title. I don't even know what those words mean until you get past the colon, entering the sixth mass extinction. And Sabayas correctly points out that as with the previous mass extinction events, life would take many millions of years to recover. A later paper, also by Sabayas and other colleagues, a couple of years later, indicates that biological annihilation is underway. Biological annihilation is not a term that scientists use frequently. This is the peer-reviewed journal literature. This is not the National Enquirer. This kind of language from a very conservative group of people using a very conservative process is, in my mind, staggering. Second author of that paper and one of the junior authors of the previous paper, Paul Ehrlich, indicates we're toxifying the entire planet in an interview coincident with the release of the paper. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. This is interesting. Earlier this week, a European body, the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System, put out a report, a synthetic report, and indicated that an increase of 1.5 degrees, that's 1.5 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline, which is when we mark the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So this body indicates that an increase of 1.5 degrees is the maximum the planet can tolerate. Should temperatures increase further, at worst, the extinction of humankind altogether would follow. Well, that's inconvenient. <laughs> Next slide, please. What's even less convenient is that more than two years ago, we were at one and three quarters degrees above the 1750 baseline. If 1.5 leads to extinction of humankind, then we have triggered already the death by a thousand cuts. But they talk about a one degree rise. How come you're saying one? Right, so the general response from scientific bodies and political bodies and certainly the media is to shift the baseline. Now we see the baseline that's commonly being used as 1980 to 2010, as if the Industrial Revolution began in 1980. Now, we have burned as much fossil fuels in the last 25 years as in the previous however many years humans were around. So there's that. But shifting that baseline forward so that we eclipse the first 200 years of the Industrial Revolution is just ridiculous. And yet, it's what's being commonly done. If we go back to 1750, Sam Karana, who's wise enough to use a pseudonym, indicates that we're at 1.73 more than two years ago, and I suspect now we're closer to 1.9 than we are to 1.5. As Hansen and colleagues pointed out, that's the highest global average temperature with humans on it so far, with our species Homo sapiens. Next slide. Next slide. There's a bunch of dying things. Nobody wants to see that. And I, here, go through these just really quickly. Okay, maybe not that fast. <laughs> One more. Here, in, in this series of slides, I'm pointing out, you can just go back and forth, that'd be really interesting. <laughs> it's like a light show. If we can have the lights flashing, that'd be even more fun. <laughs> then we can actually start dancing. So I point out several ways. If we haven't triggered functional extinction already through loss of habitat for human animals, then these are various means that could trigger very abrupt, very abrupt decline of habitat for human animals. Next slide. So I'm not going to go into them in much detail. Next slide. Next slide. So one of those, obviously, is continued industrial activity. So if we keep the Industrial Revolution going, as Dr. Berry points out, then we're going to continue to warm the planet. Next slide. Tim Garrett, who is well known for his work in treating the economy as a subset of the planetary system concludes that civilization acts like a heat engine. Next slide. To the extent that, here's the paper I was looking for, it's the 26th of December, 2018, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Sciences, indicating that climates like those of the Pliocene will prevail as early as 2030. 
if we keep the heat engine of civilization going as we've been doing so far. Next slide. And then there's, paradoxically enough, there's reduced industrial activity that will cause the global average temperature to rise even faster than continued industrial activity. I say that and people look at me like I've lost my mind. I'm not necessarily gonna rule that out. It's, it's come to be called the McPherson Paradox because I talk about this very frequently. It's called the McPherson Paradox named by Bill Eddy, who I know only from Facebook. And I point out that increased industrial activity drives higher temperatures. We're all familiar with greenhouse gases and how they hold the warmth closer to the earth and therefore, therefore allow the planet to heat up. But then there's the other side of the McPherson paradox, which indicates that decreased industrial activity, according to Levy and colleagues in 2015, as little as a 35% reduction in industrial activity drives a one degree Celsius global average temperature change in a very short period of time. The first paper on the topic that was published in the peer reviewed literature was conducted by James Hansen and colleagues. It was published in December 2011. In a follow-up interview, Hansen said that the rate of increase, once the aerosols start falling out of the sky, would transpire in five days. Five days for the aerosols to fall out of the sky and drive a, a very rapid rise in global average temperature. Subsequently, as nearly as I can tell, the scientific consensus is about six weeks. But either way, it's the, the veritable blink of an eye relative to even the lifespan of human beings. Uh, a paper in the February 8th, 2019 issue of Science indicates that previous estimates of the aerosol masking effect have greatly underestimated its impact. So this is a big, big deal that almost nobody is talking about. So those are the two sides of the McPherson paradox. Continued industrial activity is leading us towards a Pliocene type climate in which I can't imagine humans would persist long, and that's as early as 2030 from a very conservative source, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, using a very conservative process. And then if we turn down industrial civilization, we heat up the planet even faster. Next slide. So that's darn inconvenient. Next slide. And I, I show a little bit of, the, of what's going on here. The global dimming results from are from particulates that are put up into the atmosphere, mostly through burning coal. You probably most people are familiar with poor quality coal being high in sulfur, and so that's put sulfates into the atmosphere. Those are the dominant aerosols that account for the aerosol masking effect or global dimming. And they fall out of the sky very quickly. We have to keep putting those aerosols up into the atmosphere because they're constantly falling out of the atmosphere in a very short period of time. So there's a very rapid turnover with that part. So it acts like something of an umbrella protecting us from incoming radiation. If we, for example, get off the crack cocaine known as fossil fuels overnight, then in a very, very short period of time, the planet would heat up. If we keep on the crack cocaine known as fossil fuels, the planet heats up to something resembling a Pliocene climate as early as 2030, uh, according to very conservative sources. Next slide. Yeah, whatever, next slide. Uh-huh, yeah, moving on. For, um, an ice-free Arctic was projected to occur in the 2012 edition of the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences by local authors, three of the four authors of this paper are associated with the U.S. Naval Postgraduate College, very near here. And I hope to meet with the senior author, Maslowski, within the next day or two. We've been corresponding via email. And so they projected an ice-free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years. I think we've dodged a half a dozen bullets so far. Will we dodge another one this year? It's hard to say. Next slide. And I certainly don't wish for an ice-free Arctic, but as of about a week ago, it was looking pretty ugly. The 2019 line is the one on the far left that is proceeding down at an unprecedented rate compared to the satellite record, which dates to 1979. Next slide. And then as I can tell, the global average temperature increase from the loss of Arctic ice would be in the, in the short term uh, due to a release of methane 
about 1 and 1.3 degrees Celsius, loss of albedo about 1.6, 2.7 or so resulting from the aerosol masking effect. All of these numbers are conservative. They're rooted in the refereed journal literature. We don't have numbers for the water vapor feedback or latent heat, but that so far totals up to 5.6 degrees Celsius within we don't know how long. A few months, a few years after a nice free arctic, it hasn't happened on our watch, obviously. So we don't know how long that would take to reach that very rapid, stunningly high increase in global average temperature. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Jesus is really boring. Next slide. Uh, a paper that came out November 13th of last year uh, using, again, for the second time that I've ever seen it in the peer-reviewed literature, the, the word annihilate, indicates that as little as a five or six degree Celsius global average temperature rise will be enough to annihilate all life on Earth. All life on Earth. And it's interesting because Strona, when interviewed, the senior author, Strona and, and Bradshaw, Strona, when, when interviewed, and in fact, in the paper itself, they said, we can't even imagine that we could kill all life on Earth, but that's what our findings indicate. And so they're experiencing cognitive dissonance. It happens even to scientists. We can't even believe that we could drive all life on Earth to extinction in a relatively short period of time. So we're just going to pretend like that's not going to happen. Uh, it's difficult for me to imagine that even makes it into the paper because the results indicate as much and then they just take about three steps back. And I think that's okay, actually, because we can't predict the future with certainty. Anybody who thinks that they can predict the future with certainty has never been on a blind date. <laughs> okay, I think that's probably enough slides for... Let's see what else we got here. No, that's not very interesting. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you all. Just stay up here. Yes, I will.